Thank you, Sister Karuna. Are we prepared? Thank you, Lord, for spared our life to witness this day in our life. We thank you, Father, for the gift of resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for counting us among those that rise in righteousness with Jesus Christ. Father Almighty, we come before thee, land in misery of eternity, the misery of immortality and the misery of resurrection. We see the Father Almighty to open our hearts to understand. Consecrate your message, Father. I know the tongue that I would deliver it over. Open our hearts, Father Almighty. Reach us, Father Almighty. At the end of this year word that we're going to sow in our heart. Let it be a turning point in our life that our life may never be the same again. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Our Bible reading is coming from the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 26. Acts of Apostles, chapter 26. It's a long verse, 32 verses in all. And we've chosen it so that it can prepare our mind to the message we have this morning. So that we can have the, the root of resurrection, what it is all about. Agrippa, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews, therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time. If they are willing to testify that I live as a Pharisee, according to the strictest sex of our religion and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people if God does raise the dead? So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, have I received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme and being furiously engaged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged as I was joining to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were joining with me. And when we were all falling to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
It is hard for you to kick against the gods. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you have persecuted. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Hallelujah. Amen. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedience to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first, and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. That the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he will be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Amen. 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 While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. But I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, he will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I will wish to God that whether in a short time or in a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for this change. The king stood up, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with him. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appeared to Caesar. Amen. Amen. We thank God for this day. Amen. The theme for this morning, as you might have seen in your program, is the grace of resurrection. The grace of resurrection. And today, once again, we are celebrating Easter. To most Christians, it means the celebration of the victory that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had over death more than 2,000 years ago, as heralded by Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 to 57. We are all dead. It's your victory. We are all dead. It's your sting. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Why was the resurrection of our Lord of so much importance to Christian believers? And what exactly do we understand about resurrection? The Bible did mention about resurrection on many occasions. If you remember, when Jesus was on the cross, he was crucified amidst two robbers. And one of them rebuked the other for making ungodly remarks to Jesus. As we read in Luke 
23, 39 to 43, then said, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, as we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43, he replied, Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. For a second, one would like to figure out how this thief can be with Jesus in paradise, except in the spirit. To many Christians today, the concept of resurrection means the separation of the physical body from the soul, which drifts to heaven into outer space after shedding that gap of flesh that we call the physical body that houses him. On the day of resurrection, when all the dead awake to face their Lord, we are there with the bodies of all those souls that have been wandering about or resting in heaven. To most believers in the Western world today, those who believe in the resurrection of the dead, many believe that they will not have the physical bodies after the resurrection. But that is rather a contradiction of their belief. The reason for this erroneous belief may be due to the influence and confusion caused by the infiltrations of occultic studies on the aspect of reincarnation or transmigration of the soul, which tries to prove that the soul can function without the physical bodies, as it has been shown in most horror films. And this is explicitly on Christian. A non-physical resurrection is like a burning bush without smoke. There's no such thing. Resurrection means that we will have bodies. If we did not have bodies, but left with the soul, we will not be resurrected. And so how do we explain this phenomenon? God did not create mankind to experience death. To God, it is unacceptable. And that was why he also created the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, along with the tree of good and evil. As the Bible confirmed in Genesis 3, 22-24, God did not originally forbid mankind from eating the fruit from the tree of life. It was the tree of good and evil that he forbade mankind because he did not create mankind to suffer death. And that was why God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Now, before the fall of mankind, it was God's desire that man should live in righteousness and peace forever. And that was why after molding man from the dust, he breathed life eternally to him to make man immortal. But when Satan caused mankind to sin, God revoked his promise to mankind in order that the whole earth would not be polluted with sinful and adulterous generations. For most of us, who had not known the great gift with Satan, but his deceit had caused us to lose from God. Now that you are knowing, will you not take that bold step today and make a determined resolution to do away from anything satanic and throw away your old garments of sin and corruption? and follow Jesus and resurrect with him. Amen. Even despite the fact that mankind has to return back to dust, the Bible still confirms that the generations of the days of Adam up to the time God destroyed the earth with flood, lived very long, like Noah lived as long as we read in Genesis 9, 28 to 29. Noah lived another 350 years following the flood. 
He lived a total of 950 years and he died. Amen. In many Orthodox churches today, 60% of believers still could not fully understand or grasp the concept of resurrection. While the Sadducees did not even believe in the, in the resurrection, many Christians, although reciting the apostolic creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body. But what do they really believe as the resurrection of the body? Most of the learned theologians I ask believe that resurrection is a spiritual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Why not denying it? Why not deny it as a doctrine? They still deny its practicability, and which is the crux of the whole grace. This is a permanent return to a physical existence in a physical universe. What does it all mean? It means that in the new world to come, when Jesus Christ comes back to earth, as we all have been told by Jesus and many of his saints, when he will judge the quick and the dead, all the dead will rise, or all the dead will rise from the graves. Amen. The saints that will reign with him will surely not be disembodied spirits. Yes. Without physical bodies, in the world to come. If this be so, then the whole concept of resurrection is lost. Mm -hmm. The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of resurrection, both for mankind and for the earth. Indeed, without Christ's resurrection and what it means, an eternal future for fully restored human beings dwelling on a fully restored earth, there is no Christianity. The Lord told the Pharisees and the religious leaders that he would pull down the great temple of Solomon, which took Herod 46 years to rebuild in three days. He will rebuild it. They did not understand him because they were not living in the spirit, but still relishing in their carnal bodies. The temple our Lord was referring to was, of course, his own body, which will die in sin and be buried with sin of humanity. But on the third day, he will ascend from hell and rise again pure and holy from the dead with all Christians who believe. Amen. 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 The Bible also confirmed that the grave inside which he was laid was empty. When Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James, visited the tomb on that early Sunday morning, over 2,000 years ago. Now, let us now think like scholars of scriptures and not like lazy Christians who will just believe everything you are told without pondering it in your own heart. The pertinent question we should be asking ourselves today is where did Jesus' body disappear to? Was it stolen? And by whom? If his body was stolen, who are the people that will benefit from the news that his body was raised from the dead? We have a situation here. On the one side, we are the Antioch Christ, which hated Christ and will go any length to deny his divinity and his claim to be the Son of God and the Messiah, meaning that his resurrection will automatically confirm his claims. This group of people will hence just be too glad after three days to come to the grave and carry his dead body and show it to the whole of Israel, the body of the impostor that called himself Jesus Christ. On the other side, we are his followers and his frightened and disillusioned disciples who have suffered a great blow and shock that their Lord and Master have been crucified, and they too were at that moment skeptical. If truly he will rise up as he had promised or not. They too will no doubt also be interested in his body if they could get access to it. The third group are the wishy washy Christians who belong to the group of let us sit down and wait and see. <laughs> like most of us who are Christians by name. But we live as agents of confusion, 
vision killers and enemies of progress. We are quick in using our God-given tongues to pull down innocent and righteous people instead of seeking the peace and goodness of the Church of Christ. It was these vices the psalmist saw in humanity when he wrote in Psalm 122, 6-9. Pray for Jerusalem peace. Prosperity to all you Jerusalem lovers. Friendly insiders, get along. Outside outsiders, keep your distance. For the sake of my family and friends, I say it again, live in peace. For the sake of the house of our God, God, I do my very best for you. This is one of the messages of Easter. To seek the peace. To seek the peace. To seek the peace. It is when the church enjoys peace. Free of crisis. Free of rancor. Through of discord and unwarranted suspicions of the innocent motives of others that we can learn from the knowledge and wisdom of others. No one is an island of wisdom. No one is an island of knowledge or grace of God. When we pray for growth in the church, we are asking God to use every member of the family of Christ in the church to join us together to accomplish the growth. Some will be molders of the block, while some will be carpenters, and some will be painters, and some the electricians. No one can be all in one to be able to think for the ideas brought by either the carpenter or the bricklayer or the plumber, because it is not the area of your calling. And that is why our elders used to say. Two or three heads are better than one. Amen. We must have trust and confidence in one another. Amen. For there is no other way. Amen. If the church grows, we shall also grow with it. Amen. So let us thank God. Amen. To give us wisdom. And hearts of understanding. And absolute trust in him. Who sent us so that our labors shall never be in vain. Amen. Let us therefore, irrespective of whatever position we may be holding, to seek the peace of God's people church, Amen. and they shall prosper that Amen. love be. Amen. Amen. The group that we are bent on denying the messiahship of Jesus, such as the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the high priests, we go to any length to frustrate the resurrection of Jesus so that his disciples will not be bold enough to witness his resurrection and divinity all over the world. And what did they do? In Matthew 27, 62 to 66, it reads, The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember what that impostor said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guards of soldiers and made the tomb secure by sealing the tomb with heavy stone. Mm. Now tell me, in all sincerity, who among his followers can we think will be brave like Simon Peter, who out of fright even denied Jesus three times before the cock rose? All the rest of the disciples who fled for their lives or who will go and confront the heavily armed soldiers and roll back the heavy sealed stone and steal the body of Jesus. Surely you all agree with me that it was not possible except by the hand of God who will never abandon his son. Amen. 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 
as Peter attested on the day of Pentecost, as we also read in Acts of Apostles 2, 29-36. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. For seeing this, David spoke of this resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to hate, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus, God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. Being therefore exhausted from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has put out this that you both see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Hallelujah! Amen. If the religious leaders, these Pharisees, and the high priest had known that he would resurrect, they would not have taken that chances of crucifying him, since as confirmed by them also, his resurrection will give more credence to his followers and the general public as confirmation of his divinity, as we also learn from Acts 2. As they told Pilate, otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception, that this, the last confirmation of his resurrection, which is the cornerstone of our Christian faith, that Jesus is truly the Son of God, the Messiah would be worse for them than the first when he claimed he was the Son of God, was still alive. Now, to this end, his tomb was given maximum security. But what happened to this maximum security and all the guards of soldiers? The Bible tells us in Matthew 28, 1-7, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the girl shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Amen. He is not here. Amen. For he has been raised from the dead. Glory. And indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Amen. There you will see him. Amen. This is my message for you on this special day. Jesus is raised. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. My fellow beloved Christians, is it not surprising that like those High priests and Pharisees, some of us so-called born-again Christians, 